So here we have another case of interstitial lung disease, specifically pulmonary fibrosis, with a very interesting pattern. And so the interstitial lung disease, in terms of the specific CT findings, we could characterize as reticulation, so these little areas of um, linear opacity superimposed on each other, which superimposed ground glass opacity, actually a lot of ground glass opacity, traction bronchiectasis, these dilated airways more centrally, and then traction bronchiectasis, these small cystic areas more in the lung periphery. These are all not uncommon in the setting of pulmonary fibrosis, but the distribution is a little bit off. And again, there's a large degree of ground glass opacity. When you see ground glass opacity and it's superimposed on reticulation, really you're not supposed to use that finding of ground glass opacity to dissuade you from making a UIP diagnosis using the current imaging categorization, whether using Fleischner or the multi-society guidelines. That being said, there is just a lot of ground glass opacity here. And there are certainly areas here in which there does not look like there is a lot of superimposed reticulation. So there is reticulation here, both interlobular and intralobular septal thickening. So interlobular between secondary pulmonary lobules, as well as within secondary pulmonary lobules. So this is the edge of a secondary pulmonary lobule looks like to me. And then within the secondary pulmonary lobule, or this one in particular, these tiny little lines. So these are intralobular lines. These are interlobular lines around the margins, right? So inter between intra within. So here, we wouldn't really call this ground glass opacity or not ground glass opacity, which again, which, which would draw you away from a UIP diagnosis. But more centrally in the lungs, there is this more pure ground glass opacity without clear superimposed reticulation, which again would, would dissuade us from a UIP diagnosis. Also, distribution is very odd. At the lung bases, almost no fibrosis. We have these patchy areas of ground glass opacity with interlobular and intralobular septal thickening, but very little fibrosis. And as we get into the upper aspect of the lungs, we see much more severe complement areas of fibrosis. Also in the axial plane, the fibrosis looks to be more central lung preponderant rather than peripheral lung preponderant. And there looks to be at least relative be, uh, peripheral sparing or subpleural sparing in the less affected portion of lung parenchyma. So this is a hard case. And so when you come across a hard case, it's always important, I think, to take a step back and think to yourself, well, what are the common cause of pulmonary fibrosis? And so we know this. We know that the three most common cause of the classic types of pulmonary fibrosis are UIP, so usual interstitial pneumonia, NSIP, nonspecific interstitial pneumonia, and chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Sarcoidosis can certainly also cause fibrosis within the lungs and is pretty common, especially at University of Chicago. We have a large African-American population, but depending on where you work, you may see more sarcoid or less sarcoid. But if you throw in sarcoid, that probably covers at least 90% of causes of pulmonary fibrosis. Now, other things that can cause pulmonary fibrosis that we always keep in the back of our mind include drug-related pulmonary fibrosis, inhalational occupational lung disease causing a pulmonary fibrosis, and then obviously genetic or familial causes of pulmonary fibrosis as well. But those first four things, the first off, the classical UIP, NSIP, HP differential, uh, and sarcoidosis usually make up the brunt of the causes of pulmonary fibrosis. So those first four causes of pulmonary fibrosis, would this fit into any of those imaging patterns? Well, UIP and NSIP are usually going to be basal predominant. NSIP actually more so than UIP. So those are actually going to be much less likely. So this is probably not UIP. Doesn't really look at NSIP either, even though there is that ground glass opacity. But the, the upper lung preponderance really nixes NSIP as a differential diagnostic consideration. How about hypersensitivity pneumonitis? So certainly hypersensitivity pneumonitis can be upper lung preponderant, mid or upper lung preponderant, it can also be diffuse. And so when it is mid or, lung, mid or upper lung preponderant in regard to the zonal distribution, so you see a pulmonary fibrotic case that has that zonal distribution, you think about hypersensitivity, hypersensitivity pneumonitis. And that is something that I would consider in this case. I probably, if I didn't have comparison, I, I would have led with that. 
Now, is a sarcoid, sarcoidosis can also give you upper lung propaner pulmonary fibrosis. And if you look at the literature, there have been descriptions of sarcoidosis presenting with ground glass opacity. And so would I include in the differential diagnosis? I, I think I probably would. This is a hard case. And so when you have hard cases, you kind of think about maybe atypical presentations of common conditions rather than just thinking about zebra. So I would consider that in the differential diagnosis as well. But other two, I think I would lean more toward hypersensitivity and pneumonitis. One thing that does go for sarcoid here is that we see this very central distribution of pulmonary fibrosis, especially in the upper lobes. And sarcoidosis really likes to do that. HP can do that too, but sarcoidosis really likes to give this, this uh, exuberant bronchiectatic type fibrosis in the central aspect of the upper lobes. And given the fact that it has that distribution, I'll share the coronal reformation, reformation here to, again, show you the zonal distribution as well as the central predominance in the axial plane, especially within the upper lobes. Uh, but if you have that distribution and this look, I think it does pay to consider sarcoidosis very high in the differential diagnosis. I'll tell you though, um, it's not HP. This actually turns out not to be HP. And this turns out not to be sarcoidosis as well. And so another thing that is very helpful in the setting of interstitial lung disease is to look at the earliest study available or and or look at areas of lung that are less severely affected with pulmonary fibrosis. So trying to characterize this patient's interstitial lung disease just by looking at the upper aspect of lungs where the fibrosis is most confluent, most forward, is very difficult. But if we get down to lung bases, where again, the fibrosis is pretty pretty sparse. I mean, there are, there are areas of bronchial ectasis here and bronchiectasis, but definitely not as severe as the upper aspect of the lungs. I think this gives us actually a better chance to figure out what's going on. And so again, we see these patchy areas of ground glass opacity with superimposed interlobular and intralobular septal thickening, a very interesting pattern. So what do we do? You know, we should go to the earliest study that's in the PACs or that you have access to. And that's what we're gonna do here. So here's a CT scan. So this was done about 10 years earlier. As we scroll through, you can see a classic imaging pattern. This is a classic example of crazy paving. We see these patchy areas of ground glass opacity with interlobular and intralobular septal thickening. See all these tiny little lines here? So both within the secondary pulmonary lobule and along the margin of the secondary pulmonary, pulmonary lobule, those, those septa are thickened. And so it gives you this, this appearance here, which again, we call crazy paving. And crazy paving, I think, the way it was originally described was with geographic margination. That's the way I like to think of it as well. So geographic margination means with the edge of your cursor, you can draw a line around where normal lung is, for example, in here and where abnormal lung is. So geographic margina margination. So very, very well demarcated normal lung from abnormal lung. And so as you know, crazy paving, paving has a wide differential diagnosis. And so, includes pulmonary edema, pulmonary hemorrhage, atypical infection, diffuse alveolar damage, amongst other things. But it was classically described in the setting of pulmonary alveolar prognosis. And so I think that though this is not a specific finding in the subacute to chronic setting, certainly this is a chronic case, pulmonary alveolar prognosis is going to be most likely. And so once you suspect pulmonary alveolar prognosis, remember there are different subtypes of pulmonary alveolar, alveolar prognosis based on etiology. There's idiopathic pulmonary alveolar prognosis, which is an autoimmune condition. There's secondary pulmonary alveolar prognosis, most commonly associated with hematological malignancy or stem cell transplant, sometimes infections or inhalation or exposure, for example, like silica, like silica, acute silicosis or silicoprotonosis. And then there's congenital pulmonary alveolar prognosis, which I actually know very little about considering that's more of a pediatric condition. Anyways, because we know this is a chronic condition and we have this crazy paving appearance, we can be pretty sure this is pulmonary alveolar prognosis, which this turned out to be. This turned out to be the idiot, idiopathic subtype, which again is thought to be an autoimmune condition. So this is a nice example of pulmonary alveolar prognosis over time progressing into a frank pulmonary fibrotic pattern. So people have asked me, well, how common is it? I don't think it's, it's that common, but it's not uncommon either. The publication that I 
think of when I hear about pulmonary alveolar, alveolar prognosis evolving into fibrosis is this one here. And this was published in AGR at this point quite some time ago. So this was back in 2016 by this Japanese group, the Osaka Respiratory Disease Symposium group. And so this is a retrospective study in which they documented that pulmonary alveolar prognosis can certainly progress to fibrotic patterns. And so we see some case examples here. I encourage you to read that. Again, AGR, September 2016. They say that up to 20% of patients with pulmonary alveolar prognosis can develop fibrosis. I think that's probably a little bit high. This, their patient selection was not, not done in a systematic manner. It sounded more like they were collecting interesting cases of patients. And so again, I, I don't think you could hang your hat on their population numbers of this 20% positivity for fibrosis and pulmonary alveolar prognosis. But certainly I think this is a very valuable paper in reminding us that it is not uncommon to see pulmonary alveolar prognosis develop into fibrosis, frank fibrosis. And so another lesson here, I think uh, this is helpful to remember that if you have a case of florid pulmonary fibrosis, for example, here, it pays dividends to look at the more non-fibrotic portion of lungs on the, on the study that you're evaluating and at the oldest study on your PACS to see where the fibrosis emanated from. So pulmonary fibrosis is the endpoint of many conditions. And so the more data you have available to you, the better off you'll be. And certainly the more cases and, and the imaging data from the patient when they didn't have as much fibrosis is going to be the most helpful to you. The analogy I like to use is if you go to a scrapyard, so here's, here's a scrapyard. So a bunch of cars here, car parts, are hard to figure out what the car was before it was completely uh, decimated by by the compaction machine. So th that's kind of what fibrosis is. Fibrosis, just, it just decimates the lung. As opposed to if you have the, old, the brand new car or a relatively new car, everyone would know that this is an SUV. For a car enthusiast, they would know that this is a fourth generation forerunner, the only one with a V8. Right? They would see this and be like, okay, I know exactly what this car is. So Again, the analogy is this. If you have a case of pulmonary fibrosis, you're going to be better off not looking at the one where there's severe pulmonary fibrosis. you will be better off at looking at the studies or the portion of lungs where there's less severe pulmonary fibrosis so you can actually figure out what the etiology of that patient's pulmonary fibrosis is.